to do a pretty complicated topic today, but you guys are pretty smart, so I think you'll get it. But it's a really interesting way to look at the presidency and some of the responsibilities and duties that our president has. You guys know we're coming up on a presidential election, right? Everybody shaking their head? All right, and do we all know what um, three branches of government the Constitution establishes? Can someone tell me what, what the three branches of government are? Go ahead, uh, first. Well, there's the execu executive branch with the president, and huh. and then there's the legislative branch with the um with the Congress, and then there's the judicial branch with the Supreme Court. Very good. And so they're established to check and balance each other, right? So we're going to start off today looking at Article 2 of the Constitution and thinking about what duties that gives the president um, when he takes office. So when we look at Article 2, there's a few things that it tells us about the presidency. Um, it tells us how long the president can be in office. Um, it tells us how old you have to be, which is 35 years old. You have to be born in the United States and you have to live in the United States for at least 14 years. If the president can't be the president anymore, we know the vice president can take over, right? And the president gets paid a salary. It's been increasing over many years, but currently it sits at $400,000 a year. But some of the things we're going to look at today are the more complicated parts of Article 2. Um, one of the things that Article 2 says is that the president is the commander-in-chief of the military, right? But that he also gets to choose people to lead the different depart departments of the government, and he can ask them for help. Like, sometimes you guys know how when we're doing our homework, especially, like, really hard homework, we have a parent that's a little bit smarter than we are that we can ask them for help. They can kind of advise us on our homework. That's kind of the stuff the president gets to do. He gets to appoint agency heads to help him do his job, kind of like our parents help us, a little bit different. But we're going to talk about those agencies. So if you guys look at the slide up there, um, they don't get to just appoint the per people without permission or without approval. Because remember, there's three branches, and they're for checks and balances, right? So Congress has to approve his appointments to the heads of these agencies. Now, the president, uh, the executive branch established agencies to enforce laws enforce laws that are passed by Congress, enforce laws that are upheld by the Supreme Court. So our agencies do a lot of different things. All right. So now we're going to look at President Hoover and his relationship to the executive branch and look at his background a little bit. So Herbert Hoover had a degree in geology from Stanford University. He was an engineer, guy. Um, when he was running for president, they called him the great engineer uh, because of all of the things that he had accomplished in mining, especially. Um, he organized global food relief during World War I, after World War I, after World War II, and all over the world. Um, and we know that it's really, really hard to get things organized like that, right? He served as the Secretary of Commerce from 1921 to 1928. Have you guys learned a little bit about the 1920s? So we look at the 1920s and a lot of technology was changing. Can you guys tell me some of the things that came up in the 1920s that were new inventions or new technology that we had never seen before? We've been more on world history this year, so okay. they don't they haven't hit as much the 20s yet in the American history which we'll be focusing more on next year, so. No. Okay, well, we can still okay, talk so, about it. Yeah, some ideas? Yeah, Tristan. The first tank was invented in the 1920s and fighter craft, uh, fighter aircraft. Right, so, and that brings us to a bigger point that aviation was brand new, right? And transportation, so people like Henry Ford were rolling cars off of the assembly line, so more people were driving and had access to vehicles. Um, how about telephones, radio, electricity, indoor plumbing? Those are all things that didn't exist before the 20s. So our whole world has changed. And now when we think about new technologies, we usually think about the Internet, right? But the Internet has changed everything, too. So there's a lot of things changing in the 20s when Hoover takes over commerce. 
Um, he is later on the president um, after he's Secretary of Commerce for four years. Um, and then he's appointed to lead the commission on the organization of the executive branch uh, by President Truman. And it would be known as the first Hoover Commission. Um, then he was appointed to a second version of that in 1953, and we call that the second Hoover Commission. So now we're going to look at the, the Commerce Department and what happened when Hoover was appointed. Because now he's appointed by another president. He served under Coolidge and Harding as the agency leader of the Commerce Department. And so commerce is an interesting thing. Um, it, it works on our relationship between businesses and government, which is interesting, right? Because business isn't government, and government isn't really a business, it's the government. So the Commerce Department is kind of trying to um, mix that up and make them be friends and make them work together. So when he accepted the Commerce Department, it was the newest and the smallest branch of government. Um, there was only $17 million to work with this entire agency. Um, but Hoover came in and he wanted to make uh, technology and industrialism work together. And so he saw some places that we could do that, and he wanted to create three divisions. He wanted to create um, trade, transportation, uh, and communication. Or, I'm sorry, industry, trade, and transportation, and communication. Um, and he was really interested on how we could regulate that, especially looking at radio, cars, aviation, um, again, businesses, and how we trade with other countries. Um, he thought it was important that we raise living standards, that means where we live, how much money we make, what kind of food we eat, what kind of access we have school uh, to, to schools. And he wanted to make industry and business not feel so scary. He wanted people to think about it as somebody who would help the government and somebody who would help people. Um, he wanted to uh, work on general policy for commerce, like how we were trading tariffs, which means taxes that we were charging for things that were coming into the country. Um, so when he started trying to do this, it didn't work. Um, nobody wanted to give him um, authority to do things differently. So he started looking for ways to reorganize the commerce department differently. Um, he wanted to reduce spending which we see a lot in the government. We want to see how we can make government smaller. Um, he wanted to see where there was overlapping parts of the government so that we could make one department responsible for it instead of several. And he wanted to reduce waste. Um, and not just like recycling, like what we think of now, right? He wanted us to stop buying things that we didn't need and wanted us to stop buying new furniture because it was pretty. So he wanted to make sure that everything had a purpose when we were using tax dollars to buy it. Eventually what he did, because all of this new technology was coming out, was he made a case to Congress that he should be in charge of those things. And he was successful. Um, by 1925, Congress increased his appropriations, that means how much money they give the agency to run, by 140%. That's like saying if you had $1, now you had $2 and change. He gave them that much more money to run the Commerce Department. Um, and also in the Commerce Department, uh, they weren't really working with money. That was the Treasury Department. But he was still able to create a really powerful financial division. So the results of Hoover working in the Commerce Department and trying to reorganize it and make it a more efficient um, agency was that he added three divisions and he reorganized eight divisions of the Commerce Department. Um, he was he was he had taken over so much with all of these new technologies that people used to joke that he was the Secretary of Commerce and the Under Secretary of everything else. He worked on standardizing products, and what that means is like you guys know if you go to the hardware hard hardware store that you can buy a quarter inch screw and use a flathead screwdriver and screw it in, right? It's pretty easy. Back when Hoover took over Secretary of Commerce, as, or took over Commerce, 
if you guys needed a screw in your Ford car, you couldn't go to the hardware store, store to buy it. There was no standardized sizes. You had to go to Ford and request that certain screw, and they could charge you whatever they wanted because there was no competition. Or if you had plumbing put into your house, there was no standard sizes for pipes. So if you had a pipe burst five years later, um, you would have to cause the plumber you use or you would have to pay someone new to repipe your entire house. So he made sure that we had sizes, standard sizes for everything. And it increased competition between businesses. But this was some of the stuff that he was doing as Secretary of Commerce. Um, during this time as well, because he had increased safety, like you know we wear seatbelts in cars, right? When cars first came out, there was no seatbelts. There was no airbags. There was nothing like that. So he champions safety for cars so that when you guys all come to school every day, you get to school safely. Um, and stop signs, stop lights, those were some of the things that were brand new that didn't exist before. Um, he became, they started calling him the most popular man in the world. Um, and he was elected president following his time as Secretary of Commerce. So I want to look at this chart. I'm going to put it up um, for you guys to see. And it's what, how the government was organized when Hoover took over the presidency. And so you guys can see at the very top, it says executive branch. And to the left is the legislative branch, and to the right is the judicial branch. What might be harder to see is all of those large bubbles that are underneath the legislative and judicial branches are all agencies that the president was in charge of. The government was rapidly expanding. It was huge. There were so many agencies, so many responsibilities. And Hoover thought it was very, very wasteful. And he came in at a time when there was a big push for something that we called the efficiency movement. And when we talk about efficiency, we talk about something working as quickly as possible and as correctly as possible with costing as little money as possible. How many of you guys have seen on your washers and dryers the letters H-E in a circle? Or on your um, maybe dishwashers? Yeah, I see some people raising their hands. That means high efficiency. And so it does those things that we're saying. It washes quickly with very little water and costs you very little money to run. So when you think about high efficiency appliances, that's what Hoover was trying to do for the government, to try to make it smaller and more cost efficient. So if you guys look at that chart, you can see the executive branch had a lot more power and a lot more responsibilities than the judicial and the um, legislative branches, right? And we know, because we talked about earlier, the branches are supposed to check and balance each other. Do you think that it's easy to check and balance when the executive branch has so many responsibilities and so many things it's in charge of? So it's probably easier if we make it smaller so that Congress and the judicial branch can check those powers of the executive, right? So now we're going to look at some of these things broken down in a different kind of chart. Um, and this is called Classification of Activities of the United States Government According to Major Purpose. And so we're going to kind of flip through this really quickly, but it looks at regulations, it looks at services that are provided to the American public. And this is broken down by Secretary of, or, uh, Department of State, Department of Treasury, Department of War, Department of the Navy, Department of Justice. And these are all the big departments that the executive branch is juggling. And so some of the things that Hoover came in and looked at in these charts was what were they doing and were they services that the government should be offering to people? And if they're offering services, are there other departments doing that? Can we consolidate responsibilities to save taxpayers money? So the first thing he decides to tackle is the Veterans Bureau. Um, he, over, he identified overlapping functions. Um, he decided to assign a commission to really evaluate what the Veterans Bureau was doing. Um, and what he found was that there was a lot of overlap, um, and he wanted to correct that immediately. 
So they start advising, back in Hoover's time, getting a bill passed was different than it is now. The president would go down to Congress, advise them on something that he needed to make the government work. Someone from Congress would write that bill, bring it back to the president at the White House, ask for his opinion and feedback. He would give it to them. They would rewrite the bill and then introduce it into committee for review. So at this time, he approaches Congress, um, and they write Bill 6141. Uh, they called it the Williamson Bill. It also ended up pushing through um, Bill 10630. But what that really resulted in was an executive order. And an executive order is a little bit different. Um, Hoover didn't need permission of con from Congress to sign an executive order. But he wrote this executive order and signed it um, July 3rd, uh, 1930, and it officially consolidated veterans' hospitals, administrative bureaus, agencies, offices, and any relief or benefits paid to the veterans. Um, and the president did that by himself. So he gives this big speech on July 8th, and what he says is, that this new establishment becomes one of the most important functions of the government. The budget for the Veterans Administration was $800,000, which doesn't sound like a lot of money in our time, but in their time in 1930, that was a lot of money. The entire budget for the government was only $3.7 billion. So this represented a huge percentage of the government's budget. It reduced overlap, waste, it coordinated care and benefits more efficiently, and it saved the government a lot of money. And on the screen, you can see the speech that the president gave on the right um, addressing the nation about why he consolidated veterans, the Veterans Bureau and how he thought it would help the United States. Have you guys ever seen in your town or heard about the Veterans Administration, the VA? Do you guys have a VA hospital? All of those, the VA hospital and all of those benefits um, came from President Hoover. He really valued the veterans and their service to the United States and thought that their benefits, um, including their pensions and how they were treated at the hospital, um, were very important to him. And he wanted to make sure they got those benefits in a timely manner and that we weren't taking money away from benefits by being an inefficient government. So on the next slide, we'll look at, just so you guys can see what it looks like, on the very left is the bill, 6141. And this is what a bill looks like after it's printed. Um, and it's kind of cool, they all look like that. This one is a House resolution, so it's from the House of Representatives. Um, a Senate bill will just be an S dot and then the number. Um, but the Senate bills look exactly like the House of Representatives bills. Um, in the middle there is the executive order that Herbert Hoover signed and worked on that established the Veterans Administration. Um, so you guys can also see what an executive order looks like when the president writes it and signs it. And in the upper right-hand corner is a picture of Herbert Hoover signing a bill. It was not the Veterans Bill, but it was just a bill. And when a president signs a bill or an executive order, it's kind of a big deal like this. They invite people who are interested or people who helped with the bill. Um, sometimes it's his cabinet members. But this is really what a bill signing looks like. And when you guys make it to presidential museums um, later in life or, or even now, they often have pens from presidents that they use to sign a certain bill in cases because it's really exciting, right? So does anybody have questions about the Veterans Administration or how the President and Congress kind of worked together to get that established and to make it more efficient? All right. Well, then we will move forward and look at the first Hoover Commission. So President Hoover was not reelected in 1932. Can somebody tell me who was elected in 1932? Do you guys know who's president after Hoover? Right in the middle, who was elected? Roosevelt. Roosevelt, right. 
And Roosevelt was our only president to serve three terms, which was really unusual, right? But after Roosevelt, we had President Harry Truman. And Truman was a Democrat, and Hoover was a Republican, so it seemed unlikely that they would be friends. But they became friends, and Hoover worked very hard for Truman um, in trying to help him with the government and help him with things like relief after World War II in war-torn Europe um, and looking at how they could help to rebuild and provide humanitarian relief. So Truman was happy to work with Hoover on the first uh, Hoover Commission. It was formally called the Commission on the Organization of the United States Executive Branch, um, but it became known as the Hoover Commission. He was appointed the head of the commission. They began work in 1947. They worked for two years, and it cost $2 million to publish all of their commission reports. Um, it was equally made up of Republicans and Democrats. There was three Democrats and three Republicans. They um, investigated waste, overlap, inefficiencies in the government. Um, they were looking for, make, they were looking to make recommendations to kind of trim the fat around government. Um, they wrote 18 reports to Congress. Now. Sometimes when the Supreme Court makes a ruling, there's a Supreme Court justice that does not agree with them. And when they do not agree, there is a majority ruling that the Supreme Court rules and that becomes law. But there's also another equally important document called a dissent. And all of the justices that do not agree write in this dissent. And sometimes there's more than one dissent because justices disagree for different reasons or sometimes they partially dissent, meaning they agree with the ruling, but this is the things that they disagree with. The Hoover Commissions did the same thing. They built a consensus around the report that they were going to write and the recommendation, and if there were people in the commission that did not agree, they wrote a dissent. So the recommendations and the dissents were equally given to Congress to review so that there was no um, thought that maybe there was preference given to Republicans or to Democrats, that they both had equal voices in the process. Um, it was suggested that President Truman um, draft executive orders and that legislation be drafted by Congress. Hoover thought that they could accomplish all of the recommendations half through the legislature and half through executive order. So let's talk about what actually ended up coming from those recommendations. Uh, Hoover and Truman convinced Congress to pass um, the most extensive reorganization program in history. That's really big, right guys? They completely rewrote the duties and responsibilities of the executive branch. Um, we don't hear about that anymore. They did it in a bipartisan commission, meaning that Republicans and Democrats helped, right? They did it with Congress and with the executive branch. So they had a lot of help from a lot of people. They didn't just do it by themselves. The report recommended that there were 65 agencies and that they only needed a third or 30% of those. That's a huge reduction in the size of government. Some of the things that they established, to give you an idea of what these agencies do, I'll talk about the GSA first. We call it the General Services Administration. It was formally established in 1949, and it consolidated administrative functions. That means if I need a chair for my office, instead of my office ordering a chair for me that might cost $100, they would call GSA and find out if there was one in a warehouse that I could have. Um, if I wanted to get rid of a chair, I would call GSA and tell them that I was sending it to their warehouse so that another office could have it. Um, they would also reduce the amount of paperwork that we were doing, reporting, hiring, um, things like that so that we could trim out a lot of the money that the government was spending. They also consolidated the Department of War and the Department of Navy into the Department of Defense. And that was done in 1947. Um, and it saved the taxpayers a lot of money. 
some of the things the Department of Defense was tasked with was getting rid of and selling um, old war things that we had left over from World War II, um, surpluses of military things like clothing, boots, socks. Um, we still see around town, it's kind of a novelty, but there's Army, Navy surplus stores. Those were really created by the Department of Defense to get rid of extra things so that taxpayers could get money back so we weren't wasting so much supplies and money, right? So the second Hoover Commission comes about, um, well, hold on, let's back up for a second. If we think about the Hoover Commission in, in the, the early or late 40s and early 50s um, with President Truman, um, and we think about things that overlap in the government and how government is big. Do you guys ever hear in the news or even from presidential candidates now or from your parents that the government spends too much money or that it's too big? Do you guys ever hear things like that? No? Some of you guys do? Some of you don't? Okay. So um, do you guys ever hear that the government tells us to do something that some people think the government shouldn't tell us to do? Yeah, so some of you guys hear stuff like that. Can someone give me an example of something like that where you've heard or you think that the government controls something we do? I see someone in a yellow shirt with their hand up. Gotcha. Me. Yeah, Go what do you think? They control, um, oh man, I lost my shirt. Oh, dang it. <laughs> You don't have something? Someone else have something? The thing about the story is one of the facts. Speak up. Yeah. Um, there was a story this morning with the government trying to make Apple. That was more like the FBI. Oh, make Apple break into the yeah, phones? Into the phone. Yes. Yeah. Very good. So that's a great example. So the FBI is trying to force Apple to write a code that would unlock someone's cell phone. Like, you know how sometimes we have codes or fingerprint scanners to lock our phone? Because after so many attempts, it deletes all of the data off the phone permanently. And that's to help prevent people from stealing your phone. Because our phones have information about credit cards, sometimes your social security information, links to maybe your cloud storage that has your tax returns and things like that, right? And Apple is saying, the government shouldn't have the right to do that because it sets a really dangerous precedent. And a precedent means that they would be allowed to do that over and over and over, maybe even for different reasons. Um, and Apple's also worried that if they write the software, that hackers might get a hold of it and that they would be able to use it with malintent against other people so they could break into their phones and steal their information. And so Apple's filing, uh, is going to file a case in court trying to stop the FBI from being able to do that. Um, and the FBI is operating under the authority of the Department of Justice under the executive branch, right? So this will be one of those times where it goes up to court and the court is going to check that power of the executive branch and say whether or not the FBI has the constitutional authority through the executive branch to force Apple to write that code to unlock that phone, right? So there's a lot of things that are in play here, but now the question is, does the court think it's okay? And do Americans think it's okay? Do we think it's okay if Apple can break into any of our iPhones for any reason? So there's a lot of questions about whether or not the executive branch has the authority to break into our iPhones, right? Um, so this will go up through through review and process. Now, if the, the courts say, no, they don't, then the FBI can appeal it and it will go to the Supreme Court. Now, if the Supreme Court rules that, no, the FBI cannot break into the phones, you do not have the right to do that, then it's going to have to go back to the administrative function of the FBI. And they're going to have to write new rules, or we call them administrative codes, saying that they're not allowed to do that. Or if it comes back and says they can, 
Then they're going to write all new codes saying that they can break into iPhones under these circumstances, and these are who they need signatures from to do that. So that's a great example of can the executive branch do this kind of stuff. Um, some other things people typically get upset about um, from agencies are tied to the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. So some homeowners get upset that they can't spray their lawns with weed chemicals that they like or um, fertilizers that they like because the EPA says it's running off into the water that we drink and it poisons our water. But homeowners sometimes think that they should have the right to choose what they put on their own land. So there's a lot of battles about environmental things. Sometimes we see it about fracking, right? Do people have the right to, to frack for oil um, across the country? And so these are some of the things that come up for, for review and whether or not agencies have the right to regulate them. Um, and so in these commissions, this is exactly the kind of thing that Hoover would look at. Does the government have the right to do this? Or is, does, should the government be offering services like this? Some services that came up especially during the Great Depression, would be food stamps or welfare or unemployment insurance. And when Hoover looked at those things at pre as president, he said, the federal government is not supposed to offer these services. The Constitution does not give us the authority, and it's a huge waste of government resources when we should be doing things at the federal level. So when the federal government says that they don't want to do something. Typically, who do they give that, that to? Do you guys know? Who do they give that authority to? Who does the Constitution give the authority to? Do you know? Do you know? What do you think, guys? President. If the federal government isn't going to have it, who would it go to? The state. State, maybe? Good state. Very good. Hoover came back and said, unemployment insurance, welfare, food stamps, that's not a federal government problem, that's a state problem. And so that happened in these commissions. There was a lot of things they said should not be under the executive branch, but should be reserved for states and states' powers. So they took a lot of things out of the federal government and put it into the state governments to make decisions about that. So the second Hoover Commission comes about, um, and that's done under Eisenhower. And Eisenhower wasn't thrilled with Hoover taking it over. He did not appoint Hoover. Um, the Congress appointed Hoover to it. They elected him. It was not made up the same way. There were seven Republicans and five Democrats in the second Hoover Commission. So there was a lot of those dissents, those disagreements, right? Um, but they did come back and make recommendations on 19 areas of the federal government there was a total of 314 recommendations with dissent, and they were all submitted to Congress. Um, they investigated more so not how to consolidate and cut waste, but to review those services to see if the government should be providing those. Um, something else they looked at was civil service, and civil service is people who work for the government. And so he wanted to look at that whole process of civil service. He wanted to make sure that the government was paying well so that they could recruit the best people to do the jobs because he felt like the best people, the best qualified people, would be the most efficient people. He wanted to make sure that people who were disgruntled or who weren't working as much as they should were cut out of the civil service, that they were fired. Um, he wanted to make sure that there wasn't some employees being paid better than others, so they tried to standardize how people were hired and how they were paid. Um, but he revamped the entire civil service um, program at that time. And it would be reevaluated. It's still reevaluated every couple of years. It's not still the civil service department that Hoover had helped with in the Hoover Commission. So I want to look at some of the conclusions for the end of this talk, and hopefully you guys will have learned some stuff about one of our branches of government, the executive branch. 
Um, the executive branch establishes our federal agencies. So we're looking at Secretary of State, uh, Department of Justice, Secretary of Commerce. We're looking at Department of Defense, um, things like that all come from the president. The agencies tend to grow with new technology and growth of services, which means that they need to be reviewed periodically to make sure that we're not growing it ahead of making sure that somebody else isn't already doing it. So it just keeps the growth of the government in check and tries to keep it as small and efficient as possible, right? Um, Hoover successfully expanded the Commerce Department by consolidating other agencies. So it sounds like he made government bigger, but he really didn't. He made one department bigger by eliminating a bunch of other departments. Um, he established Veterans Affairs, um, which is kind of cool. Um, and it his, the Hoover Commission's resulted in the largest reorganization of the executive branch in history. So do you guys have any questions? For me, yeah, I just want to put the hand up. Um, have there been any recent recent commissions uh, uh, that were similar to the Hoover Commission? Um, there's always commissions for reorganization, and actually this was something I was kind of reading about uh, the other day. Um, our, they appoint more so now committees in Congress to kind of review what agencies are doing and how they can make them smaller. And you guys know we say Congress has the power of the purse, right? They approve funding for all the agencies. So one of the ways that Congress controls the size of the agencies is by managing how much money they give them every budget year um, in appropriations. Uh, so that way they control how big it is, how many employees they can have, and maybe kind of controls their duties and responsibilities by either giving them more money or giving them less money. Um, so that's how they're reviewing it. And the heads of the agencies go to Congress and report what they're doing, what their employees are doing, what their successes are, what their failures have been. Heads of agencies can also be called in to testify to Congress. So if Congress isn't happy with what they're producing or what they're doing or how much money they're spending, then they can call in those heads of agencies and ask them questions about what they're doing and how they're spending tax dollars. So yes, it's, agencies are constantly under review, um, but formal commissions only come every couple of decades, seems to be the trend for, for looking at them. Any other questions? Well, you guys are awesome and super smart, and I appreciate that you guys knew about our three branches of government. That's awesome. So hopefully you know a little bit more about how we check those and, and how the president makes decisions about how to, to enforce laws and, and how to review them. Um, and I think we have some words in closing from the National Park Service. All right, Elizabeth, thank you so much for for talking to us today, and, and I know I learned a lot, and I, I'm sure that all you students did as well. Um, and to the to Fireside Elementary, thank you for coming today as well and for listening in on this. And um, <laughs> yeah, you guys were great. And um, I think we'll be able to get the, the the last PowerPoint slide up that has the the website on it that you can go to. Um, here it is. All right, there's a the website for you if you want to to go and see past presentations that have been recorded and archived on there, or if you want to sign up for any, any presentations in the future, that's where you can go and get all that sorted out. So hopefully we'll, we'll see you all again, and I hope that you all have a great day.